Hey everyone, welcome back to another season of Data Science at Home podcast. I'm Francesco, your host, and I'm very glad to have you here and for trusting me with your time. This new season is going to be different as I'm going to add way more topics beyond data science, beyond artificial intelligence, and beyond machine learning. So stay tuned. I believe it's going to be very, very interesting, funny, and more pleasant than it already is. This is an episode I recorded last month. It's about Rust and machine learning. I have a terrific software engineer as a guest. Enjoy the show. Thank you for listening to Data Science at Home podcast with Francesco Gadaletta. You are about to get cutting edge insights from the people who are reshaping the world of technology with machine learning, data science, and artificial intelligence. It's time for Data Science at Home. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to another episode of Data Science at Home podcast. This is Francesco, your host, and uh, I'm podcasting from the regular office of uh, Leuven in Belgium. Today, I am not alone. I'm with a software engineer um, and a very talented one because I found him uh, on in the Rust community. So <laughs> you might understand what we are talking about today. Uh, I welcome to the show Daniel McKenna. Hi, Daniel. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. Thanks. How are you? I'm good, and it's a pleasure to have you here on the show. Um, so Daniel is a software engineer at a company called uh, Emotech. Uh, Daniel, do you mind introducing yourself to the listeners of Podcast Data Science at Home? Yeah, so, I mean, as you mentioned, I'm at Emotech. So I studied artificial intelligence at Reading, uh, starting at 2011 for a four-year course mostly using C++ because they also did lots of robotic stuff. I then went into aerospace and defense where I mostly use C++ C, a bit of MATLAB, and then decided I wanted to go more back to the AI stuff instead of the controls and signal processing side of things. So ended up joining Emotech and also a smaller startup to uh, try something different from a big corporation which is what I've been used to. And yeah, that's me. Yeah, that, that's very cool. And uh, we will get to, we will touch some of the most uh, interesting points, in my opinion, about this, which is uh, a particular programming language of your choice, uh, not yours, Daniel only, but also Emotech, apparently. So what do you guys do at Emotech in particular? Um, so we do like different machine learning solutions. We focus a lot on things like multimodal using video and audio data for education technology and selection of audio only speech services. But it's all like cloud ML stuff mainly. So you do a lot of computing and uh, a lot of uh, deep learning as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of deep learning, some hybrid systems using statistical methods as well. And mostly in Rust, but there's some C++ and Go around. Cool. And uh, uh, what's the domain, like where are these applications used? So um, the education ones have mainly been used in trials and stuff because in, well, most of our customers in education are China and Obviously, during this year, there's been a lot more remote learning for sorts of high school students and younger students. So we've been doing that and trying to. Um, so it's mostly been at home on their laptops or via their phones. Uh, we've also got some stuff for the Huawei Highlands, which is an IoT device. But that, um, that is still mainly the cloud. It's just certain things which can be easily accelerated on the device or yeah. done on device. Well, I believe that some of this technology it could be interest for video games as well, right? Yeah, we've got something which takes the uh, pronunciation understanding and some of the things we've built there and can use it to turn audio into 3D animations for how the mouth, tongue and palate move, which can automate things like animation for game development or CGI. Interesting. So you just have to record your um, voice actors. You don't need to motion capture them as well. Cool. 
<laughs> this is all cool. And uh, you know what else is cool? That you guys are using Rust <laughs> to do part of these things. Uh, now this brings us to, in fact, the uh, one of the one of several reasons uh, I I contacted Daniel is because you know there there was a common ground between us uh, that was related to the Rust programming language. Uh, now, how did you start with Rust, and uh, you know, from a personal perspective? Yeah, so round about 2015, when Rust hit 1.0, like I'd been seeing mention of the language, and it looked interesting. And I'd been mainly in my spare time doing C++ and doing like C++ 14 and more modern C++. But I was sort of constantly stimmied by how poor compiler support was for like newer parts of the standard. And I wasn't able to use it at work much because uh, my job was mainly using Microsoft for dev machines and the Visual Studio compiler was pretty bad. And yeah, it was that and sort of encountering sort of more and more C++ issues caused by like the sort of weak typing and also, yeah, just wanting a stronger type system, but also to still have low level access and not suddenly have to switch to a garbage collected language. Yeah. So I started playing around with Rust and the build cargo was obviously a lot nicer than a CMake and the like. And yeah, it just felt right. But but you still use C plus plus, right? Or you, you abandoned it completely? I uh, I don't use C plus plus for home projects anymore, but I still do use it in industry a bit. Wow. Okay, uh, Daniel, I would like to ask something that I've been asking to other people on this show. What do you love about Rust? So I mean, obviously, cargo as I've mentioned, like it makes <laughs> dependency management so much easier um when i do embedded stuff in rust like i don't have to interact as much with terrible vendor based tools or make files and shell scripts which i really like um obviously the type system i prefer stronger typing and it's like all the things when i was working in safety critical all the things which we paid for special stask analysis tools to stop us doing are all things pretty much um, enforced by the Rust compiler. So like in C++, I have to spend like a ton of money to get sort of a, tools that tell me not to be an idiot. But Rust, I get it all for free. And that's just so refreshing. <laughs> and uh, if I may ask, what do you hate about Rust? Oh, I mean, I can't hate anything truly. Um, <laughs> some parts of the ecosystem are like still lacking libraries and stuff. So sometimes you do have to roll things yourself if you want to do it. That can be a bit painful, especially if you're on tight deadlines. Uh, things like computer vision, I haven't been able to move all that stuff over to Rust yet. Um, I find pin and unpin, like I keep forgetting how they work, so I always have to look that up every few months. But I think that's really just it. How about compile time? Does that bother you? Like I said, I came from C++, like, and I like <laughs> templates, so the compile time's never been that much of an issue for me. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, fair enough. Also, because Rust, we recall, is it has been considered the most loved language uh, for like four or five years in a row. Uh, I, I don't remember, but it, it's quite impressive, you know, according to the surveys and uh, the public opinion or the opinion of uh, uh, developers out there about this amazing language. Um, uh, and indeed, you know, you, you are kind of confirming that uh, that positive wave about the language. Uh, now, when it comes to machine learning, uh, data science, and Rust, honestly with you, I've seen people raising an eyebrow. And, uh, you know, because we know how the Python ecosystem, how rich the Python ecosystem is, uh, all these frameworks um, and libraries, especially in deep learning, uh, are usually served uh, behind Python, usually Python binding, though there is a C implementation in the backend most of the time. But what do you think um, of, you know, uh, this skepticism that I found uh, when it comes to Rust, machine learning and data science altogether? 
Yeah, so I mean, I've encountered the same scepticism, but normally it tends to go away when you sort of show researchers that you don't expect them to start prototyping in Rust because they would like to sort of stay working in their experimental environments they're used to, which are pretty much all Python based. Um, when you sort of show them how easy it can be to take their model and then just host that via Rust and the difference in performance, uh, those eyebrows come back down and <laughs> smiles come out. Uh, it's like with things like TensorFlow, they've obviously got things to sort of try and deploy models to more production ready things like TensorFlow serving. And I think companies like Uber have made similar solutions to try and serve Python models for performance servers. But you tend to find with certain architectures and certain sorts of data pipelines, it's just not possible to use those tools. Right. Well, what, what do you think that Rust can play a role uh, with machine learning related use cases? Uh, you mentioned a few already, but uh, what do you think are or would be the domains and uh, in these domains, the particular tasks where you say Rust is a no-brainer there. Yeah, so I think it's also going from the research models to good inference models, which are easy to use, is obviously a big one. Uh, creating Python bindings, like as you said, a lot of machine learning libraries are C or C++ underneath. Um, for like big companies like Google, it's obviously very easy to have servers build TensorFlow for every single interpreter they want to support and every single OS and deploy all those pre-built wheels. For smaller companies, that can be a bit more painful, especially in C and C++, and it requires a lot more DevOps, whereas it's easier to get a researcher to install Rust and build the bindings if you have to if you don't have that deployment stuff. And then, like once you've got your Rust code with your Python API, when it comes to production, you can just join all the Rust parts together fairly easily. Whereas joining something like TensorFlow C++ backend to OpenCV, et cetera, in a C++ mm -hmm. code base is not easy. Yeah, that's uh, that's very true. And also there is more and more the necessity that's, of, of course, from my uh, 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 research <laughs> uh, about a lot of more edge computing and embedding, embedded devices with respect to a few years ago. Uh, and that's probably also another place where you would like to optimize things, um, you know, squeeze the hardware to the last bit. And uh, uh, and in fact, doing this in a, in a very uh, easy way. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, with the Rust toolchain, uh, it's uh, it's impressive indeed. Um, Daniel, let's take one typical workflow uh, where you know Rust becomes an ideal language for machine learning. Um, and of course, I really invite you to share with us uh, some of the workflows that you have been involved at your company. Um, something that we have been discussing uh, offline, <laughs> uh, but I would definitely like you to uh, to share it with the community if you can. Yeah, so, I mean, we've got a few different ones. We've got, uh, typically we train TensorFlow models on sorts of NVIDIA machines. We've got a few multi-GPU instances, et cetera. And then when the model's all trained, it will be packaged up in a ProsoBuff file and then in the Rust service, uh, the research will also provide like a JSON, which specifies the input tensors, dimensionality, what the features are. And we use this to sort of make it more seamless to upgrade models because things can change between different versions with different architectures of the neural network. And then we'll load them all in some Tokyo-based web server, either Tonic, GRPC, or Warp, HTTP. And then, yeah, we'll have a cloud service that runs relatively fast with tracing to get all these metrics, etc. So, so do you use any particular runtime for you know serving your, let's say, TensorFlow models, uh, like? 
Onyx or Tract? What type of runtime do you guys, or, or you build your own? So we're using the TensorFlow bindings right now. Um, I am interested in experimenting with PyTorch because, or Tract as well, because both Torch and Tract seem better for streaming. Um, in like the speech community, Caldi is used a lot because TensorFlow wasn't really suitable for streaming large amounts of audio data. But Caldi is looking at moving its own neural network backend to Torch. And um, Tract, which is made by Snips, a speech technology company, also designed Tract to be good for on device and also streaming audio through it. Because streaming adds extra performance challenges because you're going to want to start running inference before you've got all the data into the network. All right. Hmm. Which wow. makes things harder. <laughs> yeah. To, uh, but uh, when you when you mention Torch, do you mean are you referring to TCH Rust or? Uh... Yeah, the I think that's the Rust okay. bindings to Torch. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. That means that you are you have indeed Rust bindings, but be, but underneath there is the, still the C plus plus implementation, which is LibTorch, if I'm not wrong. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'd, I'd like to go tracked and have it 100% Rust, but obviously, like a lot of engineering efforts gone into Torch and TensorFlow, and I can't just turn my back on that yet. And how did you find Onyx? Onyx is, uh, for those who are not familiar, is a standard format. Uh, in fact, it's a runtime that can uh, put models written in different frameworks um, in inference mode. Uh, and so you can essentially run a scikit-learn model, a Keras model, a TensorFlow model, a PyTorch model. Um, and you can essentially, you know, convert these models into a, a, a standard uh, intermediate representation and then run this intermediate representation of your model onto a runtime. And the ONNX, I think yeah. it's, um, uh, it's the name of the format of the standard. Uh, I think Microsoft is also in the consortium, if I'm not wrong. Um, so there are some uh, Rust bindings officially released by Onyx. Uh, are you, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I had a brief play with them when looking at options for moving our sorts of models to Rust. Uh, it was quite easy getting running. I did quite like it. Um, the only bit I came into issues, which meant we went to the TensorFlow one, was uh, we were using things like the TensorFlow sort of signal module for some of the audio feature extraction. And there's not yet analogs in Onyx for things like FFTs. Yeah, I got it. Uh, okay, cool. So Tract and uh, LibTorch, these are the two uh, tools that you believe are, you know, the the most comfortable, the most reliable ones at this point in time. Yeah, from what I've seen, they're definitely the two I'm most interested in playing around more with, and probably contributing to in future. Nice. Is there any uh, project that you are contributing now in the open source uh, world? Yeah, so um, I've my main source of personal project is Cargo Tarpaulin, which is a code coverage tool in Rust for measuring test coverage. And I am a marginally more passive than the others, but I am a member of the Rust ML working group. So I've contributed a bit to Lympha, which is more of like a scikit-learn replacements in Rust. Yeah. I, I've built the ensemble part of Lympha. <laughs> I never met you there. Uh, I, I did I did a DB scan and I've got a work in progress uh, optics scan. clustering so PR. You were, the, you were in the clustering team. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So small world. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Daniel, do you want to share some uh, of your contacts? I mean, I believe that the followers of this podcast uh, are usually very hands-on people and they love to stay in touch with uh, developers like you. Um, if there is any particular project you would like to share, of course, we will report the links in the show notes of this episode. But if you want to announce or you need some 
uh, you're looking for contributors, why not? Uh, <laughs> this is this is your time. <laughs> yeah, there's obviously a tarpaulin which I've mentioned. Like you can normally find me from that on most social media and chat platforms. I'm on the same username, which is xd009642. Uh, now, not the easiest let, me thing. <laughs> let me stop you there because the first time I I heard that it was um, on a on a Rust conference somewhere on online. <laughs> I heard this guy giving this nickname. Can you explain that? <laughs> yeah. So um, at my university, uh, they gave you a random username, which was two random characters and the last six digits of your student number to make sure there were no username clashes from like having a million John Smiths or something and so when I created a github for uni group projects I used the uni username because that's what the other project people would have been sent as my name and um, then like when I started signing up to other accounts I found other usernames I used were always taken and that username never was taken <laughs> indeed <laughs> so I, I just started using it on everything because that way no one has ever taken my username. <laughs> Indeed. Well, okay. XD009642. That's not a password. That's not Elon Musk's son. That's Daniel's <laughs> nickname pretty much everywhere. Uh, you can find him on uh, on the channels that he would like to share with us and will uh, and you will find in the show notes of this episode. I um, I also invite you to join the um, uh, the official Discord channel of this podcast and uh, this show. Uh, again, you will find the same links in the show notes of the episode uh, and on the official website, datascienceathome.com. Uh, also, don't forget to uh, leave us a review on uh, Apple Podcasts. We're also on Spotify. Um, feel free to leave us a review, uh, uh, hopefully positive. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's it for today. Daniel, it was nice to have you here on the show. I'm very sure that uh, the followers of this podcast will enjoy um, uh, your, you know, uh, your experience and uh, your uh, skills and projects you are involved in. Oh, thank you. And uh, as another note, I also have joined your Discord already, so they can also <laughs> tag me and find me there. Right. I see that. Okay. Well, that's even easier. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Have a nice one. And really a pleasure to have you here. Oh, thanks. You too. You've been listening to Data Science at Home Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Podbean to get new, fresh episodes. For more, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, or visit our website at datascienceathome.com.